So I'm Federico Minozzi. Uh, I'm the head of policy and uh, project unit in the European Federation. Just welcome you all. Uh, and for this uh, Eurobox seminar on climate adaptation and biodiversity conservation. I hope you are comfortable and you have coffee and you can you're you're good to go for for an hour and a bit together with us for this session we have quite a rich panel and we'll try to uh, inspire you and um, keeping the approach that we always have since uh, 50 years now uh, in connecting people and parks together so uh, very welcome again i know there are a few coming and joining in progressively so uh, we are about to start i will just before we start, I know you are all familiar with uh, the online environment, but I will just remind you a couple of uh, logistics and practical instructions for today. Um, so <clears throat> for this, uh, this seminar, which is part of the Life uh, Natural Adapt uh, project, and we'll hear about this a bit more mm, soon. Uh, so the session is being recorded. Uh, I know you all clicked on, on the OK for this, but just for recording, so the purpose is to make this available for others uh, uh, in the future. So all the information will be accessible afterwards together with the presentations. So don't worry. Uh, you're muted except for the speakers, so you won't be allowed to speak, but you are encouraged to keep your camera on and use the chat uh, to contribute. We want this to be interactive as much as possible. So please use the chat. We have Simone uh, from our team who's waiting there and she will help you and uh, facilitate with the chat. So use the chat for questions, to ask questions that will be then direct to, to the speakers, uh, to share news or update information that you might have on the topics and to share knowledge. We will use it to share some of the knowledge we have on the different presentations on topics that will be mentioned. So some resources uh, available will be provided uh, through links. Uh, also, please stick to time. Uh, we'll try to make this uh, rich, but we have a policeman behind the scene and that's Fernando um, he's waving there he's taking care of the background work our technical work uh, with us today okay so uh, I think that's uh, more or less for me I will introduce the speakers progressively and this is uh, the agenda you have uh, seen before so thank you again for your time this morning and I'll go straight into the uh, seminar today um, the first speaker is Anne-Cerise Tissot from the uh, Réserve Naturelle de France. And Anne-Cerise uh, is the lead partner and the leader of the project. And she's been with us uh, for, for long, for five years now, and uh, always smiling and taking care of all the challenges that that complex life project uh, brings. But yeah, she's been very uh, good and we always appreciated her support and, and contribution. So welcome, Anseris, and please, uh, she will give you an introduction of what we learned uh, through this project. And so we can give a bit of context for today. Thank you, Federico. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I work for Réserve Naturelle de France, uh, that is um, French Reserve uh, Federation. And uh, as Federico said, I, I coordinate the LIFE project uh, Nature Adapt. So the idea in this introduction is that I present you very shortly the project and also try to give you some lessons learned uh, from the field. Uh, to feed um, uh, the discussions of this morning. So first of all, um, this project, its main objective is to mainstream climate change adaptation in the management of protected areas. So we are working for uh, really the adaptation 
and uh, protected areas. So we started in uh, 2018 and uh, we are now uh, at the end of the project. So five year project. The idea of the construction of this project is to work uh, by experimenting on the field. So we started of course with the literature of international literature to find what, is, what has been done before. And then we co-designed with the partners of the project a method to be able to adapt to climate change at a protected area scale and some tools to help uh, implement on the ground. So we co-designed those and then we experimented it uh, on six uh, nature reserves that are par partners of the project. And then we revised the method and the tools and tested it again on 15 uh, pr other protected areas. And then we finalized the methods and the tools. And now we are trying to spread uh, those uh, around France and Europe. So these, these are the 21 protected areas that participated in the project. So you can see it's mainly in France. So maybe it doesn't ring a bell for you, but I put some uh, images, some photos of those sites. So you can see what kind of landscapes and habitats uh, tested the method. So you can see it was mountain, also coastline, also marine areas, also open areas, uh, wetlands, etc. So we tried uh, many different habitats that we have in France, forest, of course. So what, what did we do? Before um, presenting the productions, I wanted to say a word about the different scales. So it's a European project. But as you can see, most of the work on the ground has been done in France and in French. But we have this specific action with Europark. Thanks to them, uh, we are working uh, also at the European level and we have many productions that are available in English. So uh, Olivier de Salaire, who couldn't be here, um, help to manage a task force ded dedicated to climate change. Some of them are here this morning. I also put, put some photos of them. So thanks to them, a lot of work has been done also at European level in this project. And you have also other webinars, articles. There was also last year conference of Europark on the subject. So there is some material that has been produced and all the other productions, even in French, have at least an English summary and some have been or will be entirely translated in English. So we're trying our best uh, for, to make all this available for the other countries of Europe. So what are those main productions? First of all, we try to develop a method and tools really for PA managers, really something operational. So in this uh, area of work, we produced a guide uh, to carry out a vulnerability assessment and uh, an adaptation plan. So this guide is already available in French online. Uh, I put all the links. So since you will have the presentations, you will be able to, to click on it. And an English version is coming soon of this guide entirely. Um, we also developed an online training ses uh, session for professionals. It's also in French, but we are considering right now some simplified English uh, version. And we also have many feedbacks since we have 21 uh, protected areas that uh, made their vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan. And some of them are in French, but what we have a lot also in English. So please look at those feedbacks from the ground. It's uh, always very inspiring. Another area of work in this project was to develop and manage a community as we are here this morning on this topic of climate change adaptation in protected areas. So to help develop and manage this community, we have an online platform called natureadapt.com and you can view this platform in your uh, own language uh, with your browser, you just have a little add-on to put. So don't hesitate to go and see this. This is not a website, it's really a platform to talk together in different groups. And the third one uh, is to work 
around uh, the management and, and uh, use all leverages to make it possible to help really actual adaptation on the ground. And there are many actions in this area of work, but two of them were uh, led by Europark and Federico. We talk about it in the, at the end of this morning uh, of this uh, webinar. Uh, there was there has been uh, a white paper that was written mainly by the task force on European policies, uh, giving advices about how they should be implemented in order to bring to bring together climate and nature uh, policies. So it's available online, and Federico will talk about it. And another one is a pledge. Uh, called um, Together for Climate, Nature and People um, that has been signed for by several uh, networks so far and we are trying to make it be signed by others. And the idea is to really spread uh, around the different PA networks in Europe so that every protected area is encouraged to go for adaptation. I just wanted to show you very briefly how it looks, this method to adapt that we developed. There are four stages. The first one is a stage where you go deep into the subject of climate change and you also do the framing of your work and look at what you are going to analyze in this, uh, in this process because you can't analyze all that you have in your protected area, all the species, all the habitats, etc. So you have to focus on some of them. Then the second step is a prospective analysis where the first very important step is to make a climate analysis about what, is cli what was climate before, what it is now, and what locally the climate will be with climate change. And then think about all uh, the impacts on your protected area. So this is a vulnerability assessment. And then you go to the management adaptation, find what is your strategy? Are you going to do? Are you going to let it go? Are you going to resist? Are you going to drive a little bit how it's going to work? So this is the adaptation plan with adaptation measures. And then the last one is a kind of step back before the implementation. Think about all the process that you have done and also share it and give some feedbacks to others because it's very important for this subject to have feedbacks from the field. Uh, of course, during this process, you need to do bibliography and also mobilize experts and, and stakeholders of your territory. This method takes 50 to 80 days uh, to, to go through over 12 to 18 months. This is really what we learned from the field by the experimentation of the protected areas that were partners. And uh, well, you have to give some time to the different steps, of course. So the main step is really this uh, vulnerability assessments that takes a lot of time to carry out and really think about what's the future protected area. Sorry, answer is uh, two minutes ago. Yes, no problem. I'm okay. So those are the lessons learned that uh, come from the field. First of one, the first one is that adaptation is a forward-looking and iterative process. You go and look at the future. Of course, there are many uncertainties, but you can still go on in your analysis. It's also qualitative. You work on trends and expert opinion because science doesn't give all the answers. You need to zoom out in time, in space, and also think differently. But it does, it's also time consuming. Can't say something else. You need to build skills to sensitize uh, the stakeholders to digest the different results. And it's also iterative. You often come back to the previous results because everything is interacting. So it's difficult to analyze everything at the same time. So you have to go through it different times. And it's continuous. There is no end to adaptation. So we say that after this process, you put on your climate change glasses. And uh, finally, it's even more important that the documents that you produce. 
the idea is that once you have it, you don't leave it and you always have climate change in your mind when you do your management. It's a challenge and it's also an emotional uh, challenge because it's difficult. Sometimes you see that what you are trying to protect is going to disappear. So it's not very joyful at the beginning. Uh, so you really have to go through the, the curve or the change curve that was, uh, that is also uh, the morning curve. And it also changes the way you look at your work and at your role in your protected area. So it's really challenging, but it's also a, a source of opportunities. Uh, you have new knowledge, new skills, you anticipate and you don't really only react. And you also have new relationships with uh, your colleagues, with the stakeholders, with other uh, managers. The third one is that you have also to change how you, you see the management, the conservation. You know everything is going to change. So you have to see a more, to, to think more dynamic uh, management than uh, patrimonial, what we say, conservation, uh, what's in place. So finally, protected areas have, have a, a role that is changing and it's not only to preserve what species, the species and habitats that justify their creation, but to be functional, connected and shelter rich biodiversity. And finally, it's indispensable. So we don't have a choice now, we have to go to this adaptation and uh, find a way to preserve nature, although climate change is a real threat to them. And that's it. I'm on time, I hope. <laughs> you are on time. Thank you, Anselise. Thank you for uh, yeah, bringing us back through the process. And um, yeah, I think uh, the, the point is, and those methodologies have to help us to ask the right questions, won't give yes. us the answers, but that's the point. Have the exactly. methodology that helps you to identify the questions. And then um, I hope you remind to put on yourself the climate change glasses that help to see things differently after that. So uh, I see also a lot of material already shared on the chat. So please feel free to access this while we're going through the uh, discussion today. And I would like to start now going into the case studies, really starting from the ground, uh, the ground and the sea. And uh, with uh, Lorenzo Merotto, who is from the Portofino Marine Protected Area in Italy. And he's been part of the task force that uh, Anthony has mentioned. And he will introduce us a bit about the challenges and solutions of climate adaptation in uh, the protected area. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Federico. And uh, yes, I, there, um, we work a lot on uh, climate change in our MPA, and I try to be very brief. So I'm Lorenzo Merotto. I'm a member of the scientific staff of the MPA from um, um, 2017, and I am a member of the uh, I'm honored to be the, a member of the Climate Change Task Force of Europark. And uh, the context, the, the Portofino Marine Protected Area is located in the northwest of Italy, in near Genoa, in the Ligurian Sea, and uh, is the third uh, small uh, in um, the third smallest in, uh, in Italy. So only uh, 346 hectares. And uh, as you can see in this picture, the coast uh, is mainly cliffs that continue also underwater. So we can reach uh, uh, almost uh, five, uh, um, 50, 50 meters in very low distance uh, by the coast. These uh, uh, geomorphological characteristics allow to have a lot of biodiversity with some very rich uh, um, habitats, in particular uh, coralligenous, that uh, maybe is the most important for us. We have uh, a rich community of uh, red coral. The most uh, the, 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 that live very shallow is the only place in Mediterranean that we can find 
the um, coral at uh, red collar at 20 meters deep, seagrass meadows, in, in particular uh, Posidonia, and uh, uh, seaweeds. But we don't have only biodiversity, we have only uh, also a lot of um, uh, human activity because maybe you, uh, you know Portofino as a touristic and a VIP zone. So we have, uh, for example, in this small area, something like uh, 40,000 divers per year, uh, more or less 10 professional fishermen, 2,250 uh, uh, recreational, uh, 2,000 boating, and as you can imagine, a lot of activities in uh, such small area bring a lot of conflicts and a lot of uh, management problem, and also impacts on the habitat. So um, uh, it's clear that the human direct uh, human impact have an effect on climate, on, um, on working synergy with the climate change on the habitats. So uh, more uh, an habitat is impacted uh, directly by anthropic uh, activity and more the uh, climate change is uh, strong. So what do we do as Portofino MPA for, um, for climate change? We have several, 11 in, uh, in have to be precise, 11 monitoring protocol focused on climate change. For example, the monitoring of the mortality assessment of corals, the arrival of uh, new species, the monitoring of temperature. And on the other side, we manage also, we, we monitor also the uh, human activity, fishers, um, divers, boating, that uh, often, um, as I say before, have an impact on the on the habitat. So uh, the key is to involve stakeholders in many activity of the MPA. First, uh, first of all, first of all, the, um, we have to train them in uh, in the problems of the MPA. So we do some. Uh, uh, um, quite regularly, some uh, capacity building, formation, and, and uh, trainings in order to help us uh, in the monitoring activities on uh, uh, or uh, on dissemination uh, activity, and at the same time involve them uh, in the management of P uh, OMPA to elaborate with them uh, measures, for example, an adaptation plan to climate change. And uh, but there are many steps. For example, uh, the most simple is to, to involve them uh, in uh, monitoring act activities. Um, we we train uh, often uh, the divers uh, to help us in the monitoring of mortality assessment of corals or of alien species, and uh, they enjoy a lot of this kind uh, of activity. In 2021, for example, we train more or more or less. Uh, 100 uh, um, divers that constantly uh, gather data for us, and uh, on the same uh, in the same way we do the monitoring activity with fishermen, the the professional one, the artisanal. We have all uh, only small scale fishermen, and uh, they are very important because uh, they live in the sea. Three, uh, 365 days per year, and uh, all, some of them are very old, so they they saw the change in the sea, and they help us to monitor some uh, species that, for example, the divers with some protocols like visual census cannot uh, see. All the pelagic species can be monitored only um, with the fishermen, and. Um, and the, both the fishermen and the divers are inside the management body of the of the MPA. But uh, the real goal is to involve the local uh, administration because uh, reach the fishermen, reach uh, the, um, the the divers is quite simple. And because uh, we are on the ground, the problem is uh, when we, we want to talk with the uh, policy maker. So um, we have to find some uh, language in common with them. And often this kind of language is uh, uh, the, the policy maker are necessary because uh, they do the policy. So 
they make the rules. Um, so the, the path is longer, but we have to talk the same language and the same language often are the money. So uh, with the, mainly with the University of Genoa, we do see this is a natural capital assessment of the um, natural capital inside the MPA. And so all the environmental uh, services that uh, this capital produce. And on the same uh, way, we do the vulnerability assessment to the, the, the climate change that uh, show that this natural capital is treated by climate change. And uh, we see that uh, something is moving from, uh, the, from uh, the, this, uh, this side because we don't do we don't did only the vulnerability assessment on uh, uh, environment and on the habitat of species, but also on the economical activity in the area. And uh, as you can see here, for example, the red is the diving activity that is in our area is very important from economic point of view. And uh, so the final goal is engage stakeholders and policymakers in order to direct the, to reduce the direct uh, human impact because uh, uh, is the only thing that we can do on a local scale. Um, decreasing the impact on the habitat, so increase the health of the habitat, we make the, the habitat less sensitive and uh, more, um, more resistant and resilient against climate change. What we do, except the, 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 the political part, we make a lot of uh, uh, environmental uh, education activity on climate change with stakeholders. For example, here we can see one of our fishermen that uh, make a lesson to the, some students or with the divers. So the local community, the um, citizen have to know the problem about the climate change. Uh, some restoration activity uh, not proper restoration. So, for example, the seabed cleaning with uh, recreational divers, and uh, we uh, support them also with uh, money to to um, uh, covering the expenses uh, that they do. And uh, sorry, Lorenzo, you have less than two minutes. Okay, I, I finish. Um, and the restoration of the habitat, because uh, we do, we did many, and we do many activities of some, some species, for example, some flag species like Patella ferruginea or uh, Pina nobilis, or in other, uh, in other, um, other way with uh, seagrass meadows, some uh, seaweeds or corals that uh, are keystone species uh, uh, of the of the habitat. So thanks, and uh, we are the team with the um uh, free dive champions william Neri, uh two uh, years ago so thank you thank you lorenzo thank you for inspiring us with your uh, presentation and bringing us to the coast and to the sea uh, very nice uh, i retain surely the importance of monitoring and uh, the crucial role of engaging stakeholders or partners so you need to identify who they are and then yes build together a common language to then speak to those who have uh, the money and those who are making decisions so we'll go to that uh, soon and uh, now we are uh, moving to the north uh, so uh, to uh, Finland and Santo Karexila is with us today from Parks and Wildlife Finland and will introduce us to a broader perspective in terms of uh, looking how to plan uh, climate change adaptation at national uh, level, taking into account the challenges and opportunities for protected areas. Uh, thank you, Santu, for being with us. And Santu also is part of the task force. It's been presenting several times in our seminars uh, over the years. Thank you, Federico, for the introduction, and thank you for arranging this this webinar. It's very, very nice, and thanks for for Lorenzo and Anzaris for for setting the stage already. And uh, I just tried to share, but then I realized that I couldn't put my 
Okay, now it should be working. Good. So I'm kind of yeah. So it's an example from the north, but also more larger scale perspective on on and kind of a work in progress so far about how we have been approaching this this um, concept in Finland in, in in a way that we're building a climate change adaptation strategy for the protected area network in Finland. So a little bit following from what Anseries was saying that that we need to kind of choose our battles and, and where to try to resist and where maybe to adapt or what in some cases just to accept and how how to kind of build this kind of strategy for the whole network in Finland. And I guess we can agree that uh, we need this kind of a strategical aspect as well and 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 we we kind of need to need to have a also this larger scale systematic view on, on, on how to react and <clears throat> and here's some ideas that we've had so far on and some data that we currently have on on, on how to react and on how to make this decision mm, so first part we need to kind of have a so if we want to make decisions or spatial decisions, we need to have a spatially explicit climate change rate model. So how much climate is changing and where? Second, we need to have this sensitivity analysis on what habitats exists and where and how they are being affected by the change of the climate. So how much the, uh, the habitats on different areas are actually changing or how much they're climate envelope in this case what we are looking at is changing but this doesn't yet give us now now we're kind of in the in this sensitivity or vulnerability parts that how much different areas might be might be facing changes but this doesn't yet give us a strategic view now we need to know where it matters most on what how we react to this change and this is then we need to have this spatial explicit biodiversity replaceability so which areas if they will change a lot where we will and, and if, if it's large negative changes in habitats and species then where it matters most where we have the most irreplaceable biodiversity values within our network and this is something that's very often missing in this kind of analysis and this also needs to be done in in large enough scale that we don't look at look at it in too small scale of course we need also these smaller scale or protected area scale methods and and ways to react but we also need to look at the big picture that where we have the most irreplaceable nature for example at national or european scale and how we have approached it it we have done in in parks and wildlife finland this protected area irreplaceability analysis already few years ago we have been using it for example for restoration prioritization and now we have kind of taken the next step to look at look at this kind of threat analysis so so with respect to the climate change so, so there's a lot of habitat information and species information a lot of so there's over 1500 individual protected areas in in this network or, or actually there's more but but where we have this data for and and then we have this threatened species connectedness in the landscape that we can also consider in the analysis and then from the Finnish Environment Institute and Finnish Meteorological Institute we have a very very nice data and also including ecological analysis on the on the habitat specific climate change model so there are six different factors that they have been looking at mainly about temperature and and water level or water precipitation and then we can have two different kind of models for the change and there's a, there's the change within the habitats climate envelope so in different spots in landscape where we have different habitats how much they will be in the future kind of away from their current climate envelope so when we know where in which kind of conditions those habitats occur now then how how far away from those conditions they will be in different parts of our network in the future and then also with respect to those six factors then how many of those six factors will actually be outside their current habitat specific climate envelope so we got two different levels of climate change threats so we get different kind of maps or heat maps 
The one on the left is, is the replaceability analysis. And then we have these two different ways of looking at the climate change effects. And we can, for example, now spot an area here where we have, have high level of irreplaceability. We have moderate levels of climate change in, in both of these scenarios or looking at these little bit different ways to the changes in the climate envelope. And then on the other hand, we can spot areas where we have high level of irreplaceability and all the all the kind of projections that we have been using now or combinations of this, these changes are, are showing that there's a lot of changes going on. And from these, we can now then start to develop this resist, accept, direct, red concept for these. So, so we have the climate change habitat level or patch level threat, and then we have this irreplaceability or importance of these different areas for biodiversity preservation in Finland. And we get this kind of a matrix of different combinations of these two that there's maybe no change and not important. And on the other hand, the, on in the other end, there's this too much change and very important areas. And these kind of now give us different ways to, to strategically react or to try to kind of start to create the strategy for it. So, so we have areas where there's maybe no change and not important or there's change, but the areas are not necessarily that important for the biodiversity so we so there's only biodiversity features that we have in many other places as well so in these kind of areas still keeping in mind we need to choose our battles we can then maybe accept or direct the changes if possible if we have the methods then we have the change in important places which then means that we we really kind of need to be resisting or significantly directing these changes or looking at ways and how to preserve the biodiversity values and then there's the kind of the worst case that there's too much change. So all of these six factors, for example, are going outside the current climate envelope of these habitats. And then we need to think that is there any new ways maybe coming that we might, might be able to use? Or is it then just that we need to accept and then at least know that where these changes are happening, what we are, what, what it seems that we are losing? And can we then protect those values somewhere else if it's possible. And then there's this very nice nice fourth idea that when there's no change, but the areas are very important, these are kind of identifying the climate change refugia. So, so these are areas where all the threats that we can, in fact, stop needs to be stopped. And, and this is also a very important factor to, to identify. Also, also maybe, maybe many of these have this implementation of, of of monitoring that we also need to be looking more carefully to 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 these higher priority or it's it, um, combinations in this so what we get out of it of course we get this kind of a uh, following up analysis coming coming so so when we identify these different combinations we can also look at the, what what is remaining what seems to be in, in low change areas and how to prioritize these changing areas, our actions to try to work or, or maybe to buffer the changes. So to prioritize those according to what areas best complement these areas that will be remaining. So kind of a complementary based analysis on, on how to how to kind of best best fill in the gaps in the future protected area network with the with the changes occurring. So also we can be identifying knowledge gaps and, and data gaps. So what we don't know, this is a good way, this kind of a systematic analysis to, to, to also map that, that how, what kind of information we need more. And also we can be identifying trade-offs, analyzing cost effectiveness, and, and also with respect to how much to monitor and where and in, in which kind of methods. And maybe also kind of a very big first step for us will be the identifying the magnitude of the problem. But what are we really looking at, at, at if, we, if, we, if we look at the, the kind of the, the, the balance of these different combinations of, of threat and irreplaceability? Sorry, it's to uh, less than two minutes ago. Okay, yes, I have only two slides. This will be quick. So analysis results will affect our strategic planning. So we have that level, but also they are implemented at protected area level management planning. And we are kind of currently looking at tools. So maybe this Nature Adapt tool set could be one that we will be using in the future to make the decisions at local level. And of course, this then means that that we will we will then 
collaborate with our, our more local level experts on on how which what methods we could in different areas have have what kind of tools we have to maybe maybe resist or redirect some of the changes so so it's kind of the think big act local idea very strongly emphasized here and this is the last slide so huge thank you to Finnish Environment Institute and Finnish Meteorological Institute for providing us with this data they have had very nice project where they have been have been looking at these data and 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 with kind of transforming the the meteorological or the climate data into ecological significance for them from habitat perspective thank you thank you very much Santu for uh, guiding us through the process of uh, making strategic planning uh, for adaptation on a large scale but looking also locally and I think uh, you know, looking at what you cannot lose and projection to the future and then truly implementation locally, which is quite different and interesting this year you're really interested on in the methodology that the project has developed so we're keen to uh, share this further with you and the importance of data to make decisions which are uh, crucial. I see already questions popping up on the chat, so please keep on going and also for the speakers to keep an eye on those and we'll ask them officially uh, soon. But before our uh, space for chat, I'm happy to introduce Emma Davies, uh, who, who's senior manager in uh, Palladium. And we have already heard being mentioned nature restoration, uh, how this can be crucial for and climate adaptation and mitigation and um, this requires resources for sure and a strategic plan so let's hear uh, some initiatives that are happening and um, being led also by palladium and river in uk hi good morning everyone um just checking that you can all hear me okay yes we do and we see your screen Great. Okay, perfect. Let me just see if I can start the slideshow. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for the invite um, and the introduction, Federico. Uh, lovely to be here. I must apologise up front because I've had a chesty cough, um, which I'm <laughs> still shaking off. So I hope it won't interrupt um, the presentation this morning, but I've got some water nearby. So apologies if that happens. So yes, I'm going to be talking to you today about um, Revere, <clears throat> which is an, an initiative to um, catalyze large scale private finance into the UK national parks. And this is a model that we're really keen to talk about and share because we think that there's potential for this to be replicated elsewhere in Europe and, and beyond. So just quickly a bit about me, I work for Palladium, which is a positive impact firm um, that's been working um, globally for about 50 years now, um, doing um, many, many things, but working with um, public, private sector um, and civil society to solve global challenges. Um, we have a footprint globally, but relevant for this conversation, we've been working in the climate and environment space, delivering large scale sustainable land use programs typically on behalf of governments for, for, for many years across the tropics. Um, and a couple of years ago, we set up a nature-based solutions team based out of the UK, um, looking at how we can leverage more private finance into nature restoration, as opposed to um, government funding that we recognise is, is very important, but is not going to be enough to meet the climate challenge that we're, we're facing. So, um, we set up an nature-based solutions team, which has um, started a number of different vehicles designed to catalyze private finance into nature restoration. One of those is Revere. Um, so Revere's vision is to attract private finance at a huge scale and restore nature for the long term, creating livelihood opportunities for communities and jobs across the working landscape of the UK's national parks. Um, now, I'll go back to the beginning and explain a little bit about the, um, how this all came about. So in um, 2018, 2019, we were approached by the national parks um, with, a, with a problem. Um, they had 
uh, really large scale ambitions, as many of you will also have, to um, restore, restore the landscapes of the national parks and combat climate change. But they didn't have the budget to do to do that. And they had a 240 million pound deficit. Um, so we came together to, to create Revere, which aimed to help solve that, that funding gap. And we bring together different skills to the table, which I think is um, why it works pretty well. Um, <clears throat> the national parks obviously have, as you will know, deep ecological expertise, um, relationships and networks across those landscapes, and an understanding of the role that nature can play in, in the fight against climate change. Whereas Palladium was bringing our business acumen, our, um, our network with funders and uh, finances and the ability to develop um, financial or commercially viable nature-based solutions or, or economic models. So we launched in 2021. Um, since then, we have developed a number of, um, of uh, projects across the parks and um, we are well on our way to, to launching um, or achieving large scale nature restoration. And what we have now is I think a blueprint of something that could be replicated elsewhere and um, is a model for um, demonstrating it is possible to attract private finance into, into nature restoration at a scale not, not seen before. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about what, what we've done. Um, so we started off by working with the national parks um, collaboratively to create a pipeline of nature-based investment opportunities. So what do I mean by that? Um, these are, are projects where we could derive um, um, a commercial return through the sale of ecosystem services, such as carbon, um, natural flood management, water quality improvements, and biodiversity. Um, critically for those, you need to have a buyer in the market. We all know the carbon markets are already taking off and growing. Um, in the UK, there's a growing market for biodiversity um, where uh, developers and people that are building roads, et cetera, need to compensate for their um, biodiversity loss. It's becoming, a, becoming law actually later this year. And I believe there are similar um, policies being introduced across Europe. Um, there are insurers um, who are interested in the role of nature and natural flood management reduction. and um, and we're working, we're talking a lot to water, water companies in the UK about the role of nature in water quality improvement. So those are our markets. Um, and we were looking for developing a pipeline of projects that could deliver the, the natural capital that we could uh, turn into um, um, services that could be sold. So we started off in 2021 looking for this pipeline, working with the, closely with the parks to understand and, and see um, where those projects might come from. We started working with the most, with the pioneering parks. Um, we didn't have a particular science behind who we worked with initially, it was who wanted to work with us. Um, we then set up nature finance platforms, which was important to be able to secure capital. We're gonna talk a bit about those a bit later. Um, we have now started to deliver large scale nature restoration. So we have some peatland restoration projects in, in Scotland, and we're about to start a large woodland project in, in the Yorkshire Dales. Um, fast forward five years, and we will have some ecosystem services that we can sell. Um, my role is in securing uh, buyers of those services. So I spend lots of time speaking to companies. Um, uh, we're very, um, uh, uh, we have standards around which companies that we, we speak to um, and, and do business with, and I can talk a bit about that later as well. Um, but we also have investors on board to pay up for the um, restoration work that needs to happen up front, which we and we then repay them once the um, services have been sold, and <clears throat> we then provide um, revenues to all the stakeholders involved, including the parks. So there's a bit of a whistle stop tour through the through the model. We're happy to take questions later. Um, we're now two years in, and so far we have a portfolio of projects spanning nine parks across the UK, across Wales and England. Um, many of these projects are very small scale, so the point that I'd make is that 
we spent a lot of the first year or so doing design projects, so not restoration projects, but design projects where we understood how to create these, um, these projects, the economic models that sat behind them. And we shared that learning across the park network. So a key point about Revere is we want all of the parks to learn from this knowledge and insight that we're developing through these projects. And two years in, we're, we're now ready to, to start delivering these larger scale nature financing platforms based on the insights that we've developed in the first couple of years. So what are these? Um, Sorry, Emma, do you have, you have two minutes left. Okay, um, I'll speed up. So um, nature financing platforms are basically a way to attract investment at scale. So one of the key challenges in the nature financing space is that you have investors that are ready to invest, but you don't have the large scale investment opportunities there for them to invest into because typically investors are looking for 2 million plus, much or much, much bigger. So these nature finance platforms are aggregating lots of smaller projects within one landscape um, that de demonstrate, demonstrate scale to an investor. And within those projects will be, um, we are developing carbon credits mainly and other types of ecosystem services that can be sold. That's how we've managed to attract the investment that we need to do the upfront financing in order to be able to deliver these these projects. Um, we are in the process of setting these up and we think this is a blueprint that could be shared with other parks, um, either in the UK or, or elsewhere. It's a model for attracting that private finance we need to bring into this space. Um, I was going to talk a bit about our one of our first platforms we're setting up, in, but I'll, I'll skip over that one. Um, and just wanted to, to show that the, the scale of this opportunity is it could potentially be really catalytic in unlocking funding for nature restoration if, if delivered. Um, we're, it's early days, so as I said, we're about to start our new our first one in the Yorkshire Dales and we'll have more insights and, and lessons to share in the next year or two. But what we think is this um, has been really successful in that we've been able to share the insights with across the part network and more and more are coming on board with the idea and want to, to replicate this. Um, and finally, I just wanted to touch on our principles. So as well, we're working really closely across all of the parks to establish um, the sort of qu the quality and high integrity that um, the parks um, are, are happy to, re to represent and, and stand by. So when we're delivering carbon credits, um, we are not doing commercial planting. We're looking at the putting the right tree in the right place and using native species. Um, we're working with smaller landowners and farmers across those landscapes rather than just with large landowners. We're really keen that it creates community benefit um, for smaller farmers as well as those uh, large landowners that are more easily able to access these kinds of markets. Um, we're also looking at um, optimizing for, for nature and looking at sort of habitat, habitat creation across the projects that we're delivering. Um, and I mentioned earlier um, that we're very um, particular about the type of companies that we work with. So we only work with companies that have um, uh, net zero strategies uh, in place and are not, full, um, not funding fossil fuels. Um, this is the sort of framework um, that we've developed in collaboration with the parks that we apply across across the projects so the point here being that we have to develop sort of set of uh, materials um, and frameworks that ensure quality in in the projects that, that we deliver again something that we can replicate and rolled out across across the parks sorry i'm a bit over time so i'll, I'll end there um, thanks very much thank you thank you very much emma um, much appreciated your inputs and very inspiring and something that uh, your park is considering and really keen to, to promote and support across the network because we see this can be uh, replicated this model and we're working in partnership with River and Palladium to try to see how this can be uh, extended and scaled up so elsewhere across Europe and I think it fits well with what we were saying uh, this morning. Um, I see there has been chat going on and questions, some have been answered, some probably not. So I would leave the 
floor to Simone uh, for uh, sharing some information and maybe uh, addressing some of the questions to the speakers. Thank you, Federico. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I will go by the order. And for Lorenzo, we have some questions. Uh, yeah, besides that, uh, there's a lot of comments on how the presentations are interesting. People are very happy. I want to have the slides and the recording afterwards also. So Lorenzo, people want to know more about the citizen science um, concept. Uh, they are finding it very extremely interesting and wants to know more how is the implementation and if you find the results satisfying. Also, a bit more information on how is the interaction between the local communities, sciences, researchers and the policy makers. Okay, so thank you. I, I start from the citizen science. So, yeah, the citizen science, I think that have uh, many bright side because uh, you can have a uh, uh, different level of results the worst but is good is that uh, you make awareness uh, activities with uh, citizen science i talked about uh, the um, the divers but also fishermen or people that do snorkeling so at least uh, you make some education the next level is that uh, people change the way to see uh, the environment. So, for example, uh, before they see a, a coral, a gorgonian with uh, a lot of uh, encrusting, um, maybe also colorate uh, animals, and they say, oh, wow, it's very beautiful. Then when you, you, you explain to them that are not parasites, but are epibiosis due the, to the damage, to the climate change, they say, okay, it's not good. And the last, uh, the, the, the ideal one is that uh, they take data and they are good data. What uh, we, we saw that the, the data that the divers, for example, take, uh, the, the, the trained ones, um, are more or less uh, uh, the same of, uh, of our um, or um, as MPA staff or a researcher, because the protocols have the, the monitoring protocol have to be scientific valid, but at the same uh, times, quite simple to perform. And uh, we are quite uh, um, satisfied by these, uh, this kind of, uh, of data that we think that are good quality. And uh, so how we involve them with a lot of time? The, what uh, you need is time, uh, energy, and uh, will to discuss. Because when you work with stakeholders in general, uh, that maybe have some restriction in the MPA, or some problems, you have to be ready to, to find a compromise, to discuss, to understand their, their point of view. And uh, for do this, you need a lot of time and a lot of patience. But, uh, and you have to do constantly because uh, for, uh, for one year, you forget to have a stakeholder, you reset everything. So it's very, it's very long process. And uh, it's not something that uh, you can uh, start uh, uh, today and in one month you have uh, the results. You need um, many months, years, decades maybe. And, uh, and you don't have to be the protected area. You have to talk at the same level. It's important. For example, for the fishermen, you don't have to stay above them. Because often, yeah, maybe they don't, uh, they are not graduated, but they know more than you about the sea. So be very humble in general. Thank you, Lorenzo. Santo, we also have a question for you from Simon. He's asking how you determine the climate envelope of a habitat. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's about this. So it's from the Finnish kind of a variation of where we have those habitats and what is their current climate. So, so when we have certain habitats across Finland, 
and we can look at what kind of climate conditions they are currently currently appearing in and that's kind of the current climate envelope and of course we 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 can say that maybe it, it used to be a little bit different but still they were existing also there's different ways of looking at it of course but but still we can then when we look at this variation that we have currently for those habitats and then when we look at that how much from that variation we are going to different directions in the future and then looking at that difference as a as a kind of a the amount of change but there's also Kaisu Apala, I think here present Kaisu, Kaisu is, is is the one who who has been doing the this kind of work work there on on, on for so providing us with the data on how the habitats will change. But that's the general idea, I think. And Kaisu can correct if I if I said it's wrong that it's it's about the current climate conditions where these different habitats are currently occurring across Finland. Thank you. Thank you for us uh, for responding to other questions on the chat also. We have a few of them, but not that much time. So I have a last question for this part of the session uh, addressed to Emma. Uh, the question comes from Abby. She's talking, she's asking about the funds that she says in the map, you're using public funding for some uh, projects. And she's asking uh, if this was a, to get the pipeline projects, the blueprint, uh, and then the plan is to have more uh, of the future projects privately funding. So if you can talk a bit about these yeah, two types so, of funding. Thanks, Abby. Yeah, that's a really good question. So yeah, the initial pilot projects were largely funded by government funders um, and foundations. And in England and Scotland, uh, the government has um, set up some grant fundings that are specifically uh, designed to help fund these early stage um, nature based solutions projects because they are trying to catalyze the market, but know that there isn't a pipeline. So we were using small pots of grant funding, say up to sort of £200,000 um, to start these design projects. The, and using that funding to understand how to create these projects, what are the economic models that sit behind them, um, if, if there is a market for um, ecosystem services, et cetera. And then the idea being to set up these larger scale nature finance platforms, which bring, bring in the private finance. So I would say that that design finance has been really, really critical to, to getting the model off the ground. Um, and, and Scottish um, government and, and government in England have been um, really playing a role in that space. I think um, Wales are planning to follow suit sometime this year or, or next year. Um, so yeah, that's exactly that's exactly right. Thank you, Emma. We will try to address the other questions in the chat. So feel free to mark the speakers or others also. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Simone, and thank you for the answers and questions. Um, I'll move now to the second session of this seminar. Um, we have heard the importance of engaging uh, regional authorities, national authorities, and European authorities when developing strategies uh, for climate adaptation. Like the skills have to be implemented in the complex landscapes. So uh, I would like to invite our next speaker, who's Alexandra Cabral, who's director for landscape planning in the region of North Portugal. And uh, she will introduce us a bit about their initiatives in planning and integrating biodiversity and climate change uh, at regional scale. Thank you for being with us, uh, Alexandra. Thank you, Federico. Thank you especially to you for this invitation and to have this opportunity to share with you our uh, vision, our work. Uh, good morning, everybody, again. Um, this presentation has a very, I hope, I hope uh, catchy title, the ABC Challenge, but indeed uh, it corresponds to what we intend to develop in the region. And um, as my, well, all the time is a little short and I will not dare to exceed these 10 minutes. The presentation is, um, is divided into three parts. Who we are, what do we have in the region and uh, what we want to achieve with this approach and this um, 
uh, work and the solutions we want to explore towards a uh, uh, pathway to regional uh, carbon neutrality. So um, what we are uh, is uh, the north of Portugal, uh, and what we are has to do with the uh, CCDRN uh, jurisdiction, which is the regional level. And uh, it has to do also with the fact that our region is uh, orographically very vigorous and has a dense um, hydrographic uh, net, a network. And um, it has a, a huge concentration of population and the territorial occupation with edification along the coast, and it becomes uh, more fluid and uh, less uh, impact and, um, when we move towards uh, east. So we are uh, more than a third of the Portuguese population, and uh, we are the regional authority of land uh, planning. We are developing our regional master plan. We expect to make it approved by the beginning of 2024. We are also the regional coordination authority of the structural funds. Uh, we are increasing our uh, planning policy coordination because Portugal is starting a decentralized process of governation um, and it's uh, gathering more responsibility in the regions. And uh, we are also the regional commission for the integrated management of uh, rural rural fires system. And um, what we think we truly have of special is this uh, uh, joining of um, the expression of natural uh, areas and uh, conservation uh, areas. And they are distributed with this uh, network of national areas. We have on the top of uh, Portugal in here, as you can see, the unique uh, national park. We have this uh, expression of the natural 20,000 network, and we have also common lands here. And altogether, we used to call, uh, not use, we are starting to call it the uh, area of natural excellence of uh, the north of Portugal. And altogether, it, uh, it uh, fulfills uh, over than, 600k hectares of this uh, of these uh, areas but if we combine this and uh, overlap this um natural excellence area uh with the uh, corridors um ecological corridors uh sustained in the main rivers and ridges uh we increase this number to uh over uh, a million acres, hectares, sorry, um, of natural um, expression in the region. So for us, it's very uh, important because we think we have the ground floor to uh, try to use these areas combined with some others more occupied with population and uh, edification and we can all together join towards this uh, way to natural, neutral uh, carbon uh, neutrality. But everything of this and uh, in this vision of carbon farming uh, joined with carbon capture and storage, we think we are all aligned with the um, uh, European um, objectives and strategies and uh, policies. So we think we can do uh, this uh, approach by joining this with uh, our knowledge that we have in this meanwhile developing about carbon farming and carbon capture uh, through the, this, uh, this uh, next uh, approach that I'm going to present here uh, to you. Because if you see this map, we, we develop uh, an approach in, uh, in the north that could reach these uh, three uh, areas, sub areas in the region where we can try to um, introduce some pilot areas and some pilot projects that we can uh, try to um, 
make a proof of concept and then uh, try to replicate these approaches to some other regions uh, in Portugal. And uh, we think that we can, because uh, we have to mitigate in uh, region one, we have to protect the carbon stocks we still have in region two, and we have to increase uh, the carbon uh, sequestration in the um, region C three, because it has been uh, a very, um, very, uh, it has been in a very uh, big uh, lost process of carbon because of the, the rural fires. Uh, we think we have all the ground floor to um, make this uh, like um, the, the future of the, the neutrality action. So we want to uh, make of these uh, an approach and uh, when we look to this map and then we overlap with the ones I've shown you about uh, natural excellence areas, they are almost uh, in direct overlap. So it's a very huge challenge to um, make uh, this uh, aqua biodiversity and carbon a reality. And uh, in that uh, matter and in that purpose, what we want to do is to indeed um, install the regional observatory to certify all the neutrality actions. Um, one provoke, provoke, um, uh, even uh, due to what uh, uh, Emma was saying to us, uh, before, we think um, we cannot impose a regional carbon market. It all has to be voluntary and we have to make a proof of concept to try to demonstrate that we can go in, uh, in another uh, direction or in parallel directions more. So we, are, uh, we have already a, a good knowledge about carbon neutrality. Uh, we want to share it. The map we've you've seen, it's uh, all based on um, on um, very small, tiny, uh, I don't know if you have the same organization, but our admin administrative uh, approach is to something we call uh, uh, um, a downscaling size uh, of municipalities. So we have developed it in that uh, major way. Um, we want to um, make a huge effort to control the rural fires. We are implementing the action plan of the system. We are naturally available to integrate a network and uh, share our results and learn with uh, the other regions and uh, and other results and other knowledges. And uh, we want to implement our pilot projects. One of each of those areas I've seen, I've shown you in that uh, last map of carbon distribution. So this was what we had to share. Um, and uh, I'm available to talk with you a little bit more about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for uh, introducing us to the complexities of yeah. planning at regional level uh, when we speak about climate change adaptation, uh, biodiversity conservation, and uh, reminding us on the importance of uh, yeah, uh, the role that protected areas and Natura 2000 sites uh, can play uh, on the map and on the ground. And this links well with the next speaker, um, who is Stefania Carisiadu, and uh, from the European Commission, uh, DG Environment. And uh, it's been uh, uh, always a pleasure to work closely with uh, Stefania over these years. Uh, she's been a bit the interface between the project and the Commission, the European Commission. So thank you for your support and for the inputs you provided over the course of the project, because we wanted really to make sure there is a link uh, between the, what's happening on the ground and what are the policy ongoing developments. So uh, thank you for being with us uh, today. Um, yeah, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Federico, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, very happy, actually, um, being here today, and I've heard a lot of interesting uh, presentations. Um, so uh, today I will uh, briefly um, talk about the EU policy priorities on nature and climate change nexus. And uh, to start with, I will just say a few words about like my unit and where I work from. So I work at the Nature Conservation Unit. Uh, and my presentation does not move. Yes, voila, there it is. And this is the unit that works with the, uh, with the Natura 2000 network of protected areas that most of you know about. And this network is the largest coordinated network of protected areas in the world and is designated under the nature directives, which are the birds and the habitats directives, uh, with the aim to ensure uh, long term survival of Europe's uh, biodiversity. Uh, currently, this network covers around 18% of EU's uh, terrestrial area and around 9% of uh, the marine. And uh, although that this framework exists for many decades now, um, according to the last reporting of member states, uh, we still see that uh, nature uh, doesn't do very well and uh, a lot of uh, species and habitats are not in what we call uh, favorable conservation status uh, at the moment. So in recognition of uh, both uh, the climate crisis and uh, the environmental degradation, uh, the Commission some years ago proposed uh, the European Green Deal, which is the overarching uh, framework we are uh, currently working with. And uh, the European Green Deal has uh, a strong component on biodiversity and nature. Uh, in particular, on uh, biodiversity, the most important strategy, I would say, is the EU biodiversity strategy for uh, 2030, which has the overarching uh, target to, to bring biodiversity on the path to recovery uh, for the benefit of people, the planet, our economy and the climate uh, by 2030. So the biodiversity strategy has uh, four pillars, and I will talk about the two first, which is uh, the nature protection pillar and the nature uh, restoration one. So on the nature protection pillar, the biodiversity strategy included uh, some very important commitments for 2030. Uh, the first commitment is, is to enlarge the network of uh, protected areas. So we, so we legally uh, protect 30% of EU, EU's land area and 30% of its seas as part of uh, a trans-European network uh, of protected areas, integrating also important ecological corridors to allow also for species migration and consider uh, climate adapt adaptation in this process. One third of this, uh, uh, of this part uh, should be strictly protected, which means like 10% of the EU land and seas, uh, with a specific focus on uh, carbon rich uh, ecosystems and including also all uh, primary and all growth uh, forest uh, as well. And of course, this area should be effectively managed, uh, having clear conservation objectives as well as measures and be monitored uh, appropriately. So on the second pillar on EU nature restoration plan, there are a lot of commitments for 2030, which I don't have the time to uh, talk about, but uh, there is one, one commitment to ensure that um, habitats and species do not deteriorate further. And at least 30% of these uh, that they are currently not in favorable conservation status. And um, as I talked about in my first slide, there are a lot of them. They should reach this category or show a positive trend uh, by 2030. Uh, so how do we stand uh, now concerning these commitments? So um, these are, of course, uh, voluntary commitments uh, for member states to implement. And at the moment, member states are developing their national pledges on how they plan to, uh, to contribute to these specific targets of uh, protected area enlargement, as well as the status improvement. 
Um, so the initial deadline for member states to submit these pledges was in March uh, 2023. So far, we have only few member states, uh, only few mem uh, member states pledges that are actually publicly available in uh, report nets. Uh, but uh, member states are working on them, and we expect in the next six months actually to have uh, more uh, submissions. So uh, to help member states uh, deal with this work and progress, then there will be uh, dedicated discussions in the framework of the biogeographical seminars uh, that we organized during 2023. And also uh, by the end of the year, the idea is that we, we should have like a first evaluation of the pledges and the development of dashboards to so, so the commitments of the member states are uh, publicly and uh, available and uh, easily accessible. Uh, when it comes now to, um, to the second pillar of uh, nature restoration, I would like to brief briefly talk about uh, one, and according to my personal view, maybe the most important initiative that the Commission uh, proposed. Uh, and this is the proposal for an EU nature restoration law that uh, it was published uh, one year ago uh, in recognition that protection, simple protection is not enough and the voluntary targets of the previous biodiversity strategy were simply not, not met. So there is a need for a reinforced approach. So, uh, for these reasons, uh, the EU came forward with, with a proposal for legally binding EU nature restoration targets to restore degraded ecosystems and uh, with a particular focus on those ones with the most potential to capture and store carbon, so to, uh, to contribute also to climate change mitigation, but also to prevent and reduce the impact of natural disasters and contribute to uh, climate adaptation. So uh, this proposal uh, sets an overarching objective uh, for the recovery uh, of nature across EU and uh, EU land and seas through restoration of ecosystems and also to uh, contribute significantly to EU climate uh, change mitigation and adaptation objectives. Uh, the proposal um, um, proposes basically that member states should uh, develop uh, restoration measures that will cover 20% of the EU land and sea and by 2030 and by 2050 um, there should be measures in place to cover all ecosystems that uh, there are in need of restoration. So um, the nature restoration law uh, proposal is coupled with uh, specific targets for specific uh, ecosystems and in particular these uh, there are specific targets for protected habitat uh, types and protected species under the birds and habitats directives but also uh, targets for habitat for marine habitats uh, beyond uh, the nature uh, directives there are also targets for the um, for the expansion of the green space in urban ecosystems. There are targets uh, to improve river connectivity and restore free flowing uh, rivers in the EU, uh, targets to, uh, to increase uh, pollinator populations, and as well as targets uh, uh, including uh, specific indicators that should be reached in order to improve um, ecosystems, in order to improve biodiversity in agriculture and forest ecosystems. Sorry, Stefania, so, you have two yeah. minutes left. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will follow. I will, uh, yes, I will catch up. So uh, the member states uh, basically uh, should have to prepare uh, the so-called national restoration plans, identifying all the necessary measures for all the targets and quantify and map uh, their restoration areas. And they should also uh, define um, specific synergies with climate change, mitigation, adaptation and disaster prevention as part of their national restoration plans and uh, identifying synergies also with other uh, national um, uh, climate adaptation plans and strategies. Uh, so uh, 
uh, about the timeline, um, it is under negotiation. At the moment, the NRL and uh, our co-legislators are expecting actually to reach um, an agreement soon. And uh, in particular, uh, the Council at the moment uh, is having a meeting to reach general approach and the European Parliament will uh, follow in uh, mid-July, hopefully. And uh, the, hopefully there will be trialogues in the second half of 2030. And finishing the presentation, I will just uh, would like to add uh, one more commitment uh, on nature included in the EU adaptation strategy to climate change. And there the Commission um, committed to integrate adaptation in the update of Natura 2000 and climate change uh, guidance, uh, as well as in the guidelines on biodiversity friendly afforestation and reforestation and the forest st strategy. Uh, on forests, uh, the Commission recently adopted two uh, new uh, guidelines on biodiversity friendly afforestation, reforestation and tree planting, and as well as on the mapping and strict uh, protection of EU primary and old growth forests. So I invite you to have a look at them. And uh, regarding Natura 2000, and with this I will close the presentation, uh, we're in the process of uh, updating, as we promised, the guidelines we have on climate change and Natura 2000, incorporating uh, climate change adaptation uh, with the aim to provide practical uh, guidance and advice for Natura 2000 managers and uh, nature authorities. And uh, Natura Adapt, of course, it's one of the very uh, important projects and has been particularly helpful in uh, this work. And uh, with this, yes, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Stefania, and sorry for rushing you through the no, no. slides. And uh, there's a lot happening uh, at the Commission at the European level, and a lot of attention on nature restoration and, uh, and climate and biodiversity. And thanks for mentioning the uh, updates of the Natura 2000 and climate uh, guidelines. Uh, you know we are interested in be contributing to that, and uh, I know that there, there would be some questions, so you prevented that to come. And also for mentioning uh, effective management, which is an important part of our work as well. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, invite our next speaker, who's Mr. Robbie Beaver. Uh, he's a member of the Committee of the Regions. Uh, the Committee of the Regions is uh, an important uh, European institution where uh, regional and uh, local authorities are represented. And Mr. Beaver has been uh, largely involved and engaged in the biodiversity strategy and on nature restoration uh, debate. And I have to say, always been a, a, a nice and good friend of Europark. So happy to have you here today with us to introduce a bit what is the perspective of regional authorities uh, when we are going to speak about climate adaptation uh, planning. Thank you again for being with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Federico, for introducing Committee of the Regions and myself. And of course, uh, I'm very happy to contribute uh, to this uh, event uh, this morning. So, uh, as you said, uh, climate change is uh, the most urgent global challenge of our time, and it must be urgently addressed uh, at all scales of uh, governance, meaning also at the local level. So, it's uh, estimated that currently three quarters of all uh, EU residents live in cities, regions and towns, and uh, this uh, even increasing. So that means that cities and the regions <coughs> sorry, are at the forefront uh, of the necessity to adapt to climate change uh, and uh, to biodiversity loss, uh, especially in these uh, even warmer uh, climate times we are facing. <coughs> So as uh, extreme uh, weather events become more frequent and intense, we must remember that adaptation happens at the local level because local communities are the ones who will have to deal with the consequences. At the same time, adaptation action should be implemented from the ground in harmony with citizens' needs. Uh, that is uh, why local and regional authorities must be at the center of all adaptation efforts. The synchronization of climate and biodiversity agendas is very important, especially through ecosystem restoration, since a healthy environment provides protection from extreme climate events, 
ecosystem services, as well as human well-being and animal welfare. There's an urgent need to restore nature, since more than 80% of habitats in the EU are in a poor status. Healthy ecosystems provide great benefits in terms of clean water, air, food, energy, well-being, and so on, and the restoration of ecosystems is cost-effective. It is proven that the benefits of nature restoration outweigh the costs. Every euro, one euro invested into nature restoration adds uh, from eight to 38 uh, euros in benefits. So the benefits of ecosystem protection extend beyond the environment. For example, restoration can spark local economies by increasing green job offerings and creating opportunities for tourism. The benefits of restoring nature are science-based. The EU nature restoration law will enable the long-term and sustained recovery of biodiverse and resilient nature, as well as contribute to achieving the EU's climate mitigation and climate adaptation objectives. We as uh, cities and regions are doing uh, much for restoring nature and adaptation to climate change, of course. Cities and regions stand in the front line when it comes to facing the climate biodiversity pollution crisis, but they are also closest to the citizens. Cities and regions are also on the lead when dealing with the degradation of the environment and its consequences to local communities. As public institutions, local governments are more agile than national governments when it comes to developing and adopting new policy instruments and plans. Several cities and regions already have a local climate adaptation plan and, in, and are incorporating climate change adaptation measures into their management actions and planning options. Cities and regions are responsible for implementing various EU strategies aimed at nature restoration and climate adaptation within the framework of the European Green Deal. Subnational governments play an important intermediary role between EU, national, and local governments. We would like regions to have the flexibility to tailor these strategies to their specific local contexts. In the EU nature restoration law, member states should develop, uh, develop national restoration plans to achieve the targets. We consider that the LAAs must be strongly involved in the drafting, implementation and monitoring of these plans, since we know best the local conditions and the socio-economic context of the areas. LAAs should also play a key role in identifying restoration areas and determining indicators based on local priorities and com community needs, as well as ensuring policy coherence and creating synergies on the local level. EU cities and regions represented by the EU Committee of the Regions actively participate in shaping EU policies related to nature restoration and climate adaptation. The Committee of the Regions acts as a platform for dialogue between cities, regions and EU institutions, fostering cooperation and collaboration. We provide input and expertise to ensure that regional perspective perspectives are considered considered in the decision making process. Let uh, me give you uh, some examples. The Committee of the Regions' opinion on the EU nature the EU nature restoration law indicates that success of ecosystem restoration will largely depend on the correct implementation and the quality of measures applied at local and regional level. Therefore, cities and regions should be supported by proper technical assistance, adequate financing resources, and specific funding. On the other hand, the Co Committee of the Regions' opinion on adapting to climate change, challenges and opportunities for the local and regional authorities emphasizes the following points. First, need for effective multi-level governance promotes the mainstreaming of adaptation across policies and at all levels of governance and highlights political commitment at all levels. Second, need to develop the administrative capacity of local and regional authorities to implement adaptation measures and they are key players as demonstrated in the developing and implementing the most suitable measures, but usually are faced with limited resources and human resources expertise. And third, the need to ensure climate finance is available for investing in adaptation. 
decentralized delivery of adaptation finance through local governments ensures that investments align with local conditions and citizens' priorities and help preventing maladaptation. So the COR also serves as a platform for sharing knowledge, experience, and best practices among EU regions. It facilitates the exchange of information on successful nature restoration and climate adaptation initiatives, allowing regions to learn from each other and replicate effective approaches. This collaboration helps access, accelerates progress and ensures the transfer of expertise across different regions. At the same time, citizens and regions through the COR engage in events and cooperation activities to foster partnerships and joint initiatives, such as the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, the Urban Greening Platform, or the Horizon Mission for Adaptation. So in conclusion, EU cities and regions play a vital role in advancing nature restoration and climate adaptation in Europe. Our involvement, especially via the opinions and other activities of the Committee of the Regions, ensures that regional perspectives are considered, local challenges are addressed, and efforts are coordinated for a more sustainable and resilient future. A diverse range of actions are already being developed to restore nature and adapt to a changing climate in the EU. By working at the regional level, it is easier to effectively address local challenges, leverage regional strengths, and contribute to the overall resilience of, of uh, Europe. So thanks uh, for giving me the chance to contribute to your event. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bieber, and, and thank you for your consideration and, and the work you're doing uh, in the Committee of the Regions for Biodiversity and Nature Restoration. Yeah, just to remind everyone, the debate is very hot at the moment on nature restoration. So please, uh, if you have the chance uh, to support and connect with your national authorities or the members of the parliament at European level, please do, because the votes are pretty tight and we need support for nature restoration. So uh, uh, a small spot uh, here in between. Uh, and I think, yes, you, you stressed the importance of regional authorities in, in planning uh, and implementing nature and climate adaptation strategies. And this is something we have learned also through the project that we were sharing today. So I would like to give up space to uh, the speakers to react to some of the questions that popped into the chat. I see we're pretty late on the schedule. So maybe, uh, Simone, can you just uh, summarize a couple of questions um, to the panelists? Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Yeah, we have many questions and some answers in the chat also, if you want to have a look. But I would like to ask uh, Stefania. Here I am. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Stefania, we have a question uh, about the linkage between the 30% uh, protection areas and the 20% restored areas. How is the overlap uh, between the two measures? Uh, you mean the 30% protection of the voluntary tar targets, uh, I assume? Uh, well, th those, in a way, they're like two different initiatives. So the 30% is a voluntary initiative and the member states you know pledge for uh, uh how they will uh contribute to this percentage in their territory and in the biogeographic regions and uh when we talk about the nature restoration targets this is something different this uh, if it is adopted it will come as a binding targets and it's an eu um it will be hopefully a regulation that everybody will have to uh, to follow uh, the same specific targets, um, and um, I also see um, there there is a question about uh, if this could be extended beyond uh, the protected areas. Uh, yes, exactly. I mean, this is the point, and in particular in marine habitats that uh, at the moment uh, currently they're not protected. 
Thank you. We also have some questions about extended topics beyond the EU. So one of the questions come from Mirna from Lebanon, asking, saying how the EU strategy and policy framework is very important and if it will be extended to the neighboring countries. And we have a question coming from the Grupo de Intervenção Sinotecnico, uh, if there's any concern about the African swine fever and how it influences the biodiversity and agroecosystems in Europe. So I leave it open for all the speakers. Please, Mr. Bivam. Yeah, just to uh, take up uh, the uh, question about uh, uh, going beyond the EU, I can I can affirm that we as community regions are quite open to have uh, also synergies and, and exchanges with uh, other countries, other municipalities uh, beyond the 27 uh, EU member states. Uh, so uh, just don't hesitate to come up uh, to us and uh, see if we could exchange uh, quite a good uh, practices and uh, all what uh, we have done so far. Don't hesitate uh, to approach a committee of three. Thank you. I don't know if we still have time, Federico, to open the mix or... Maybe one last question, um, we'll close. So any, anyone uh, who has a, still a burning question, uh, I want to, uh, we're happy for you to speak and address the question to, or maybe uh, one of the speakers might have a, a, a question to each other. Okay. So I think we've been uh, uh, pretty clear and I would like to thank you uh, all. I'll just share um, uh, some, some concluding remarks from my side. So uh, I think uh, um, Anselise mentioned them um, two things that we have been producing as part of this project. And we have heard a lot of actions and initiatives that the project has led. Uh, but an important element uh, are two, two um, initiatives that Europark has been promoting to ensure this has a this project has a future and, and there is implementation beyond. Uh, what has been implemented in France. Um, what we are calling for, uh, we are calling for to uh, a white paper that's been built thanks to the support of the Europark Task Force and um, with the project partners and in partnership also with the European Commission and Stefania has been uh, kindly supportive in this process. So we have developed a white paper it is mainly addressed to the European institutions, but I think it's a, a good reference also for regional authorities and other authorities at national level who might have a role in ensuring uh, a strategic planning for climate adaptation. And here you see the four uh, main messages uh, that we have been addressing and that are elaborated in the text of uh, the white paper. So uh, the white paper is being shared and you will get the link and I encourage you to disseminate it and, and promote it uh, across your contacts. And the second element that we, we mentioned before uh, is what we will be doing and uh, what we are asking you to do is to ensure that the work that has been done to uh, this project can have a future and uh, I can engage actively protected areas, Natura 2000 sites and networks uh, working locally. So to, to integrate climate change within planning and practices, 
to undertake vulnerability assessments locally, to develop partnerships and raise expertise and capacity um, among managing authorities on climate adaptation. So the pledge, which is a very trending name uh, at the moment, uh, is a call for uh, particular for networks, national, regional authorities, but also for protected areas to uh, get engaged and take uh, advantage of the results of the project to move on. So please uh, subscribe it. There's a list of already uh, institutions who have subscribed to it and it's open for subscription and we are happy for you to endorse it as well. Um, the last message really is really to thank you all. I would like to thank the speakers for the interventions uh, and all those who've been behind uh, your intervention, those who have been providing the data, those who have been uh, leading to your information that we had the chance to, to share today. I would like to thank the audience, you all, uh, for being with us uh, today. And obviously, uh, the, those who have been uh, leading and making uh, the project, the Natural Adapt project, a uh, success. And thank you all for being with us.